Yes, sir. I sent you the DM. Yep. I need help. Yep. I've been trying to write this book and do more public speaking. I do it now, but whatever I need to do to get 10 minutes, 15 minutes for your time for me is traveling. I'll do it. I just need to carve out that time to pick your brain, share a little bit of my story, and get your help to get my career and my personal life to the next level. Answer is yes. Yes. Colleen in the corner will schedule that for you. Please listen to what he just said. That's how you ask for help. Wow. Right? I need 10 minutes of your time. Right? Show the respect that, you know, people ask me all the time, hey, can you invest in my company? And they write this long, long thing that doesn't belong on text or LinkedIn or anywhere, even email. And my response is always, send me a business plan. But yeah, I've got to see, there's a billion great ideas out there, but I want to see a plan on how to monetize it, how to make money from it. And that's what a business plan does. And I'm happy to help you. I got to tell, you know, I don't have a business plan. Here's a template. This is one of the best ones that I've seen. There's always a the help. That's how you ask for help. And if somebody tells you they don't have 10 minutes for something, they're not living. Come on. I have a 520 rule. Every phone call of mine is five minutes, or a, a goal of five minutes. Someone asks me for 10, I'm going to hold him to 10. Now, I'll go over my five minutes to help somebody. I could change his life. I spent years trying to figure out how to write books and speak. But I know the reason my books are so good is because somebody helped me. And he took 15 minutes. And then what I did is took how he wrote his books and made it mine. And then also had relationships that accelerated what we were doing, right? Oh, let me introduce you to you know, my book publisher. Let me introduce you to the guy who prints books cheaper than anyone, Rose Printing, down in Florida. So I can afford to send free books and pay for shipping to help inspire people. Thank you. Great, yes sir. Yeah, I have a question for you. And going up, did you have like any mentor or anybody helping you out? Uh, yeah, so what, what made me successful at a young age is that I didn't have a dad. So I felt very comfortable asking for advice from my football coaches, my uncles, right? I was in need of, of a father figure, so that way to, for me is I found mentors, and I always have my mom. Now, the best mentor or B is by example. Kids don't listen. In fact, I, I hate to offend anyone here, I think the stupidest species on earth is a teenager. I, I got three of them. They're really they're stu good students. They're good kids. But God knows. Ugh. Hi. Yeah. Nicole Doss, um, Hi. Of Prestige Society. What was one of the pivotal things that allowed you to take a company, build it, and reach that million dollar mark? So first of all, I, I didn't put numbers on things. Good question. There's mile markers. So a million mile marker for me, my, my end is much bigger. So what I started realizing is if I didn't put time on, on to, to my goals, because time's a man-made construct. The minute I started putting times, I need to make a million dollars by 30. I need to do, well, w once you do that, you actually create resistance because you're saying there's not enough. It's actually a scarce thing of doing. And I don't like to put exact amounts. So there's a great word to use, minimum. Right, minimum. I want a minimum of a million dollars as fast as I can. I even, for money, when it comes to money, I have a simple mantra. I want to double the amount of money I make as fast as I can. The universe gets that. I just want to double whatever, you, whatever God you've given me, I want, to, I want twice as much as fast as I can so I can give twice as much as fast as I can. There's no resistance. And you'll start saying things you think, say, do, believe. You'll be amazed when you start analyzing yourself how many limiting beliefs that you have. And energetically. Look for the patterns, right? I love my teenage daughters. Oh, I'm not dating a guy like that again. Next guy she dates is the exact same guy. Just blonde hair instead of brown. And I got friends with a lot of money. They got five wives. Never marry a girl like that again. Exact same girl. In fact, in Orange County, they look the exact same in the back. Great question, often asked. What advice would I give to the, my younger self? It's the same advice that I gave myself when I was 35 years old. Radical humility. Radical humility come from that place. Be, and when I say come from that place, be aware when you are talking with your ego. Ego, need to be right, need to be offended, 
need to be superior, need to be inferior, need to be separate, need to be angry, need to be frustrated. All of these different needs of the ego do nothing but get in my way. The, right, the, the insecurity, all the fear, like if I just, I still today on my nightstand there's two words. It used to be thank you, but I have my own free thank you app and all kinds of thank yous around me and that's ingrained in me. I still have to have radical humility right there on my nightstand. Be radically humble because it's so easy to buy your own bullshit. There's no better liar in the world than yourself to yourself. There's no bigger or better liar. And if you live in radical humility, you will be able to consistently get better at not lying to yourself and not treating yourself so poorly and not getting in your own way and not creating more resistance than you need. All the things are right there within radical humility. Great question. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Radical, how to be radically hum humble. Number one, ask for help. Best example I can give you. Humble people ask for help because you're saying, I don't know. Another example of, of radical humility, being able to give what you have. Being able to give, it, it shows you're confident. This is what happens in the universe. When we're afraid of something, when we're not radically humble, it's like looking over a ledge and we're focusing in on, oh, I don't want to fall, I don't want to fall. And invariably, you fall. Because when you focus in on what you don't want and you're not radically humble, you get what you don't want. So you fall off the cliff and sure enough, you grab onto a stick and you're hanging there. And then what do we do? We look up and say, is somebody up, up there that can help me? I'm a victim. Is somebody up there I can help you? And there it is, God or the universe, whatever you believe in, says right away, I'm here, I'm here to help you. Just let go, I'll catch you. And so what do we do invariably without radical humility? Hold on tighter, look back up and say, anybody else up there that can help me? And then we wonder why we keep falling off the ledge and, hang and feel like we're hanging on to a stick. You wanna know the definition or example of radical humility? Somebody that has the ability to let go and know that they're gonna be caught because they live in a world of more than enough. We just aren't smart enough to know what that is. We just have to trust it. And when you're radically humble, you're able to trust it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I was gonna ask because I didn't hear you say that you didn't um, have your uh, father when you were um, younger. How does a child that lost both parents find um, motivation through someone like you and who? Uh, being successful in life. <clears throat> Great question. So if you don't have two parents, find somebody. Just like I didn't have my father growing up that was available to me. And I, I re-engaged with my father when I got older and he taught me one of the best lessons of my life when I was 30 by giving me a jacket with no pockets. My dad, when I was 10 years old, told me he missed my birthday and it crushed me, told me it was because he didn't believe in birthdays. And so uh, to heal what he had done wrong, he then punished me every year as a kid and purposely missed my birthday to make a point. At 30, he felt bad, bought me a jacket with no pockets and I was bitter and, and I was like, are you kidding me? But I was weird because it fit me perfectly, which meant he took the time to ask somebody what size, it, you know what I mean? And he gave me the best piece of advice. He looked at me and I said, are you punishing me again? Because I'm over it. I'm old now. I, my job is to understand you, not change you. And I love you and I want a relationship, but this doesn't help. And he said, son, that jacket isn't for wearing. So I tore all the pockets out of it. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, it's for hanging in your closet. And I want you to look at it every day and realize that you can't take anything with you. I want you buried in that jacket. Right? You, I don't, <laughs> he said, I don't want you to be the richest man in the cemetery. That's no good. I see so much of you in me, I don't want it. And sure enough, I was just like him. All the things I hated about my father, I hated about myself. And so what you wanna do to answer your question is find somebody, could be me or anybody, that sits in the situation, you almost are at advanced. I was with Matt Higgins, he's the head of RSC Ventures, chairman of the Dolphins yesterday. And he, he has a GED. And he went in to talk to the kids yesterday and they're like, oh, Richie Rich, you know, owns a helicopter, blah, 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 right? And he's, he just shocked them and said, nope. I was like you, <laughs> it took me three years, I got my GED, I dropped out. All of a sudden he earned respect. 
all these things, you're not a victim if you don't have two parents. You're not a victim if you don't have any money. You're not a victim if you have one leg or you're, you're not a victim. It's your story. And the coolest thing about the story, when you have challenges and you're, over to per, you're able to persevere over those challenges, you get extra respect. Extra respect. Oh, he grew up with nothing like me. And he did it. You are able, when you break through, to start bragging about, I didn't have any parents. I was abused as a child at nine. Right? I, I say things publicly so that people that are like me are inspired and say, that didn't hold him back. He's not a victim. What am I doing here? So whether you have one parent, two parents, I know people with two parents and they're better off with no parents. So you got to find somebody that inspires you and can help you and is willing to. Now, I'm a time freak. I'm over time. I'm more than happy to stay and answer more questions. If anyone needs to leave, you are not going to offend me. I have no need to be offended, but I do want you to be on time. But you're welcome to stay. I'll stay here as long as you want to answer questions. Does that sound fair? Okay, cool. All right, cool. Any more questions? Yes? Um, how do you balance being like a parent and traveling with other things? Great question. He asks, how do I balance being a parent and married and all the things I do? Be a student of your calendar. Don't just look at your calendar. Study it every day. Best piece of advice business-wise. And don't just look at what you're doing in person on the phone, being email and text. Look at the empty spaces. And so I spend a minimum of one minute a day calling, texting, emailing my mom with a specific purpose, to tell her I love and appreciate her. Oh. And it changed my relationship with my mom. I started to realize, why is my mom asking me to do dumb shit? She can do that herself. Well, because she wasn't feeling loved and appreciated, so she was trying to make me prove it to her. And so I keep my eye on my daughters, right? The good thing about teenage daughters, they don't want to hang out with their dad. So I use my white space every single day I make sure they get a text or a Snapchat or I go Instagram Live and tell them I love them. That's how they communicate. So study your calendar, what you are doing in person on the phone via email, text, and social, and then study the white space. How, oh, one last thing. Use a lens of productivity and accessibility, right? How productive am I gonna be? How accessible am I to the people that I most love or most relative? Because my wife told me, changed my life, she looked across the table one time, I'm on the phone at dinner, and she says, why is it that you treat people you barely know better than me? How can you treat a customer better than me? I saved your life, you moron. And she did. That changed my whole life. I'm like, hold on. And I did the same thing with my health. How is it I'm treating strangers better than I'm treating myself? And I can't give what I don't have. So I started leaving work to go work out. I started getting a trainer. I, you know, I spend more on this beautiful body than a Ferrari. If you knew what I ate, you guys would be like, you are an incredible human being. You're in amazing shape for someone that eats as much as you. But yes, use that calendar, be a student of it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question for you. I see the question. I want to ask you, I know your time is tight. No. Nope. I want to know, like, um, would you like to be someone like a mentor? Would I like to mentor you? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Just go see Colleen over there. Um, it, 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 I have many ways, we'll, we'll figure out, I have a, a background thing that I'll have you fill out so I know exactly how I can mentor you. Now, he said one thing, I know you're busy, I get that a lot. I am not busy. You are not busy. Everybody has 24 hours of activity. What I am is productive and accessible. So I use rules like my 520 rule. I use systems in place to say, you know how many people want me to mentor them? Not a problem. You can do some work, right? Yeah. Let me know what you want. I have a little survey for you to fill out, but I will, I'll give you my cell phone. Real time, 4 a.m. to 11 p.m. Pacific time. Call, text, email me. I'll get right back. I'll get the, it doesn't take me long to help. It's that 10 minutes that pisses me off when people are like, you know, I don't have 10 minutes. I got a guy that's a close friend that I mentor and work with. He owes me money too. But he's like literally all the time. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I was too busy. Right? I wasn't too busy to fly across the country on Saturday. Prioritize you as a friend over my family. But so many Sundays, oh, you know, I'm driving the kids to SeaWorld. I didn't have two minutes to check in. I'm supposed to be helping you. It's okay to tell someone, 
by text. How long does it take? Hey, sorry, I'm caught up in this. I will try to get back to you today. Doesn't take long. I answer all my DMs, my LinkedIn, everything. And I find a way to get the answers to you and be a good mentor. But I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste my time. I'm productive and accessible. Yes, I'll mentor you and anyone else that needs help. Just reach out. Colleen will send you a background information. I'll get it all thing. And we have you know, group mentoring, individual one-on-one, -on -one, my cell phone. Every single person that wants mentoring gets my cell phone. You can call, text me. Just be concise. And let's get you the answers to accelerate what you're doing. Yes, ma'am. And you're next. Great. What do I look for in a business plan and how would I like it to be presented to me? Number one, initially I'd like it to be emailed to me. Two, what do I look for? First, the people involved. Second, the idea tied to how much money. Right? I look through all the BS stuff, right? Like, I, I had an elevator pitch competition at Fashion Week. I was a keynote speaker there and the, the, this one lady, it was like the whole business plan was about the market size. Come on. Yes, I know people wear t-shirts. <laughs> I don't need five slides on people wear t-shirts. I want to know how you're going to make them money because a lot of people wear t-shirts and who you are. Right? I would rather someone sit in my elevator pitch show and literally say, I grew up with nothing, this, nothing. I was beat up and I went bankrupt. And, and then this is what I've learned. 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 And I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. Like I was with Ray Lewis and he's like, grab my leg. And he's like, the difference between me and anyone else, I'm like the lion in the jungle. I'm not the strongest, fastest, but I'm the fiercest. And what does that mean? I'm willing to die on that field and give every single thing. I'm not going to quit. Whether my arm's broken in the Super Bowl or not, I'm not going to quit. And when he looks at quarterbacks, I was with another quarterback yesterday on my podcast and he talked about Ray Lewis. He goes, man, he looked, it was like John Randall. When he looked across the line, it went right through me, his energy. He meant it. That's what I want look for in a business plan. Do you mean it, right? Someone tells me, oh, this is my life, so, so, so as soon as I raise the money, I'll quit my job. And eh. you know how many companies are there finance? Why am I gonna have a part-time guy? You know, make it yours. Part-time, part-time, you shouldn't be raising money. You should not be raising money if you're working on it part-time. You should be bootstrapping it, and that's fine. But when you're ready to go, right, put it in, be ready, build value in your company. In the end, if you raise money when you're part-time anyway, you're going to end up losing your company, even if you're successful, because you're going to have to give equity for the money at the low valuation. It's simple math. And I've coached people. One of my younger coach went to Harvard, brilliant guy, brilliant company, raised $40 million, and then couldn't realize why the board fired him and he had no equity. He worked like nine years. That happens all the time. Happened to my friend that has an alcohol company too. So don't raise money too early. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the 5 Yeah. <laughs> so it's 520 is the way I call it. Yeah, great, great question. I move so fast, sometimes I think everybody knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, 520 rule. My goal is to keep every phone call to five minutes. What does that mean? That means that people who work for me, people I talk to, I manage their expectations from the start. Now, there's been an added benefit to the 520 rule, which is I've now been branded that way, which is really cool, right? Oh, don't mess with, Dave will give you five minutes. Very gracious, super humanitarian, and he does it. But people come into my meetings, it's so fun because I keep every meeting a goal for 20 minutes. So I have like captains of industry that will come into the office and say, I know Dave, we got 20 minutes. Right? Everybody's gearing towards this. So they prepared more. All I'm doing is being more productive and more accessible. What does that mean? I can be more productive in the meeting because everybody's on point. And two, I'm more accessible because there's more five minute chunks in phone calls. So I can afford to take an hour or two hours a day to take five minute phone calls and mentor 12 to 24 people a day. And then you add that up to 365 days and you know that everybody doesn't need you every day and you realize, Dave, how do you have a thousand people you mentor? Right? And I get you to a point where you can afford one-on-one -on -one mentoring where we have scheduled calls and, right, I'm introduced, you know, but at the beginning, just little pieces of advice changed my life. I can do that for you. Yes, ma'am. So I would like to ask for five minutes. Yes, ma'am. Uh,
Thanks, Christina Madison. Very inspired by what you um, mentioned today, just simply because Suleiman thought this would be a great topic. Uh, at 35, I was an executive of a $1.3 billion organization, been in philanthropy for a decade plus, raising millions of dollars. Uh, tomorrow's my last day as I'm launching my own firm. Beautiful. So what I do is I really want to make a meaningful impact in the arenas that you're in. I've seen so many athletes have a passion to want to help their communities, but when it comes to philanthropy, they really don't have the right business infrastructure to make a meaningful impact. And my tagline is philanthropy reimagined. So providing a best practice business model on philanthropy so people can really get it right the first time because there's people on the other side to be impacted. So I would love to talk to you more. Leave Done. in five minutes. Done. Uh, but I'm looking forward to having an impact with you and others. There's a lot that she said there, right? There's a lot of credibility. So she sold me on her, right? I got an idea, but this is my track, right? That, that's what we're talking about. In five minutes, I can, at the beginning of a business, really accelerate what she's doing and provide clarity, balance, and focus and confidence, leveraging the dummy tax of all the businesses that I've succeeded and failed in. Uh, right here, then. Yep. Um, so I don't really do the email thing a lot. Yeah. But I wanted to know if we have a book. I've been reading um, T. Hervin, T. Hervin, I think. Hervin, something like that. Um, yeah. So I've been reading on that book, and I read the books about laws of attraction. My first thing is this. Uh, if have, if you Can I get a book? book I would like to read it. You got it. Do I have a book, Justin? The second thing is yep. um, how do you continue on without fear? Because fear has been the biggest thing that stop me from succeeding in a lot of areas in my life. So fear is still present in my life. I just cancel it. So any negative energy, fear is a negative energy. So what, what I do is physically cancel it, I'll, even out loud. If I, if I start feeling fear, because the last thing I want to do is focus in on what I don't want. You know, and I use, you guys are in school, so the, the easiest one that happened in my whole life, all the school I did, I would go in, especially in law school, man, I hope this isn't on the test. Because you got one test when you're in law school at the end. Oh God, I hope they don't ask about this. Hope they don't ask about this. Hope they don't call on me. Hope they don't call on me. Dave, please rise for recitation. Shit. That's exactly how life works. So what do I do? The minute it comes in my head, I hope this isn't on, boom, cancel. I just tell myself, cancel. It's not going to be on there. This is what's going to be on there, what I want to be on there. This is the question that's going to be on there. I know this question. I know this question. No, no, you don't. Yes, I do. Cancel, cancel, cancel. I literally, it's in my book. I cancel, clear, and connect. And because I'm, what, ha what happens, just real quick, thank you for staying, is our bodies have a cellular structure and a cellular memory. And so we have 10,000 new thoughts a day. 10,000 new thoughts. And if we don't control them, they start going into our subconscious and we have 40,000 of the same thoughts every day. That's why some things bother us and keep coming back because they're in our subconscious. And those subconscious thoughts create neural pathways in our brain that create efficiencies. It's a rewiring of the brain. So how do we rewire the brain, which eventually goes to our unconscious so we carry an energy or deactivate the genetics we don't want? is by the first 10,000 data points that we're getting every day. So if we got garbage in, we're gonna get garbage out and attract more garbage. If you put good stuff in, what you want, it goes to your subconscious. Now you don't gotta work for it anymore. It's just every day, I'm grateful. Like I know that gratitude's in my unconscious competency now. But it took me nine months, talk about I told you I'm one of the biggest hypocrites. I was still on stage telling people, just say thank you, 30 straight days, it'll change your life because it took me nine months to do 30 straight days. That's how far in my own way and what a hypocrite we all are. I'm my biggest hypocrite. So make sure you're controlling the 10,000, be aware of the 40,000 so you can benefit from the unconscious competency of energetic and genetic attraction. But you gotta do the work. There's the laws of the universe and the laws of Goya. And I stole the law of Goya from John Asaroff, right? The law of get off your ass, right? That, that's it. And it goes right along with the laws of the universe. They are complementary. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, I'm in a management course right now, and we're talking about like skills and management. I just want to know what are some of your skills that you would look for in management? Oh, easy. What are the skills I look for in management? Someone that is able to communicate a culture. People come in, I have internship program, I got employees. They're, it's so fun, because some of them want to be sports agents, marketers, PR, journalists, all this stuff that media guys, I have a media company, and they are so excited the first day, I say, okay man, I'm gonna teach you four things. 
Gratitude, empathy, accountability, and effect. If I can get a manager to empower his people and her people with gratitude, empathy, accountability, and effective communication, it all, with all the other things, it, it, everything happens fine. So I look for a manager that can create a culture. The skills and knowledge, pff, come on. We can all learn that stuff, especially in my business is sports. <laughs> Good question. Yes, sir. So this has been a very interesting talk because you've had a wide range from the extremely pragmatic to the very metaphysical. Yeah. And you kind of took us on a journey about how one influences the other. So, and, uh, and what I got was a lot of your life is changing around certain points in your life in which you had to change your intention or realize that something, something very internal, intrinsic, wasn't manifesting outwardly. Um, even if it was your intention or, or something else. So if you don't mind talking about kind of that, that power of the intention yeah. and, and how to, to manifest it pragmatically. Yeah, so the power of intention, how do you manifest it pragmatically to reality? Very simple. And please get one of my books as well. Here, here's how it works. Number one, what is your what? What is your what first? I can't tell you how many people, they don't know what they want. So the first step in... And doing that is imagining, imagining what you want. The best part about thinking what you want or imagining what you want is you create a statistical success automatically. What's the difference? If I don't know what I want, I'm not going to get it. The minute I think about what I want, it becomes a possibility. A mathematical difference between zero. So the first step is in my life, I always was thinking what I wanted, what the what. Then. I start thinking about the why. I th look at how it affects or impacts my foundational values, my personal experiential giving and receiving values. I start getting clarity, balance and focus, more confidence, my energy's changing. Then something happens, I get inspired. So when I know the what and then the why inspires me, right? Oh, this is why I'm doing it. I want my kids to have a better life than me so they can help even more people. X plus David plus them. The why now gives you, so the what gives you a mathematical advantage, the why gives you a bigger advantage because it takes a possibility and it makes it a probability. When I'm inspired, my possibility is a probability now. And now you're saying, how do you manifest it into the real world? Well, it's not, it's in the woo-woo world. Inspiration is in the woo-woo world. I'm inspired. I have a mathematical advantage over all of you because I know my what and why. I tricked in a possibility and turned it into my probability. Now I know one thing. There's only one thing that stands in my way from making my probability my reality or my perspective because my reality is my perspective. Any of you that are married know that. How do I do it? Well, I used to think the way to do it was to go out and get it. It's not. I use strategy, I use discipline, I use awareness to get out of my own way. I don't use time as a resistance, a man-made contract, and I don't use my ego as resistance. I get out of my way, I surrender, like in surrender experiment. I surrender by using action and trusting that I'm gonna get my probability into my perspective or reality. And I use strategy, discipline, and awareness to do that. Those are actions. Those are actions. And so I can take any idea by thinking what I want, it's a possibility. Why I want it, it's a probability. And how am I gonna get it makes it real. And the way to get it is get out of your own way, put the necessary value into it, and let it come to you as fast as you want. That's how you do it. It's very woo-woo in the start and very pragmatic and ball-busting in the back end. <laughs> You know, I always say, if people, if, if I knew what I had to do to get to where I am today, I'm not sure I'd have the courage and strength to do it. But consistently every day, it got me there, one inch at a time. Great, great, great question. Read my book, please. That's exactly what my book goes into detail about, manifesting what you desire. And I have them here, connected to goodness. And I have it here for you. And if we run out, I will mail it to you or, or email it to you, either one, and pay for it. So don't worry. Uh, one question back then you, sorry. Thanks for taking my question, but my question is, what would you say to the students and the fine ladies and gentlemen in this room that are going through their own personal struggles 
like you did, and now you said you lost a brother. I know like it must have been a very tough time for you. Now, what strengths did you gain from events in your life that happened? Like everybody's struggling in this room with things we know of and things that we don't. So now, what do you get pulled out of those circumstances to make you who you are today? It's the enjoyment. The, the enjoyment of the struggle. It's infusing purpose and passion and profitability into every single thing, seeing it as my advantage. When my brother passed away, I didn't have that perspective. I, I, I learned so many great lessons. When, when my brother passed, my brother wanted to be a doctor since he was five years old, just like I wanted to be rich. So he sacrificed every single thing to become a doctor. My brother told me when I went to college, don't get well trained, get educated. I, he goes, I'm no better than a plumber. I, I love medicine, I love helping people, but I'm no better education-wise than a plumber. I'm just a plumber with an advanced degree and the body's my toilet. I'm well-trained in the body, but I'm not well-educated. He goes, Dave, you know so much about so many things. Keep doing that, keep learning about all these things, stay open. I started realizing, first of all, I have struggle. It's not in the past. Every day, there's struggle. Things, it's life, but I love it. I, I put infused purpose and perspective, just a quick example, I know we're late, but I, I think it's important because this changed my life. It's my trash example. I hated taking the trash out. And it would spill on me, and, it, it, and because I hated it, of course, everybody always asked me to take the trash out. As a kid, in my fraternity, I ended up with three daughters, right? I'm the trash man, and I hated it. <laughs> And I, if there was glass in the trash, I guarantee you I'd cut myself. And then I'd get mad and I'd throw it harder and then it'd spill. Or, you know, if I was wearing my nicest suit to go speak, that thing would be dripped on. I mean, trash. I, I took your question to heart one day and I said, wait a second, everything in my life is my perspective. I'm just going about this the wrong way. There are no struggles in my life. There is no trash in my life. There's no trash. What do I want? What's the what? I know what I want. I want more time because I'm 520 to the max. I want more time to think about what I want because I, that's how powerful, that's how manifestation starts with the what. So every time I saw trash, what a great thing. Trash became my outlet, not my devil, my nemesis, my dirty friend. It wasn't my brother's death or me losing my money or my dad leaving me or whatever else still you know, I'm working through emotionally. That trash was my friend because everywhere I went when I saw the trash, I could be of service and say, oh, I'll take that out. And then I took it out nice and slow thinking, man, I, this is what I want. This, this is my possibilities. I'm gonna make it a probability. And I used it to become inspired. All of a sudden, my energy about trash changed. And here's the miracle about trash. Not only was I one of the most popular husbands wherever I went because all the other wives were like, you see that fool? Right? And my, my friends hated me because I'm always making them look bad by taking the trash out. Little do they know, I'm not doing anything but escaping all of those idiots so I can think about what I want. Meanwhile, they think I'm of service. But here's the most interesting that happened. I completely changed my energy about trash. And guess what happened in my house? My 17-year-old daughter, who was going to school for the very first time ever, instead of overloading the trash and having it spill over, like somebody else was gonna take it out. I know who the moms are now. <laughs> and dads. I couldn't believe it. Because I shifted my energy, and what I realized is I shifted the energy of joy and put purpose into my trash. The same as the 17-year-old. I did, uh, went up on the roof, and I jumped off onto the pool, and that 17-year-old, she saw the joy. She couldn't wait to get up on the roof, right? That's what I did with the trash. I made it as cool, it was just an energy. And I never told her to do it. Same thing can be with any struggle, if you infuse it with the right purpose and perspective, you can actually derive these great things out of it and you can shift your own energy. You're not a victim. It's all coming through me. You could, you know, for my brother too, I just feel so grateful that he, he's with me. Someone told me a great question. Who here has said someone die in their life? Okay, we all have that in common. How do I deal with it now? I ask myself, would I be able to ask, answer a question just like my brother or my dad? Those are the two most significant people that I've passed in my life. I've had roommates, sometimes, you know, 
And I answer invariably, no doubt. I could answer any question you said just like my dad would. My dad's still with me. And that makes me feel really good. Right? It, for some reason, made me feel really good. Great question. <clears throat> any other questions? Yes. So, yeah, me. I forgot about you right in the middle. I feel like I'm your Puerto Rican daughter, Mr. <laughs> nice. <laughs> everything that you're saying. Can I be your older brother? <laughs> I hate getting old. This sucks. <laughs> yes, okay, I can okay. be your dad. Okay, my, That's fine. I'm your Puerto Rican younger sister. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, but I created a product called Plan, Pray, Slay the Planner because I'm, I'm such a good steward of my time. So I teach women how to start their day with gratitude, how to say affirmations, how to write down their to-do list, right? But me and all my goodness and all my positivity and walking in my purpose, that's not leading me to financial abundance. Great, so great. It's, where do I get it? Because it's so hard to be creative when you're like, how am I going to pay Comcast? Yeah, right. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That is probably the best question for a business school. And the most common one that's asked of me. Passion you have. Purpose, no doubt. Positive. Skills, knowledge, desire, no doubt. Profitability. Yes. Profitability is as important as passion and purpose. Profitability. So what we need to do, we need to realize that, and I tell people, you got two choices. You can build a business. You can build a business on passion and purpose. It, eventually, if you don't last, it, if it gets too much. Or you can make money. You can make money with passion and purpose. You know, mostly in schools a lot of time, they'll question my tagline on my company, my mission statement. Make a lot of money, help a lot of people, have a lot of fun. It's not help a lot of people, have a lot of fun, and make a little money. I sponsored my kids' high school football team, and they would not put my tagline on the scoreboard. They changed it to help a lot of people, have a lot of fun, make a little money. And they were insistent on it, and I wanted to support the program, so I allowed them to go ahead. I have my thing trademarked. I'm not ever trademarking that because that's bullshit. <laughs> and I don't want my kids looking up at the scoreboard, and I was glad the team is losing because then they don't want to look up there. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not glad they're losing. But what I, my advice is go back, re-engineer the vision of your company to how can I make money. Look at the direct path to revenue. Carry 120. What value am I providing in my business that I can say, can you see any reason why you wouldn't want to do this? And now, your clients, just because your clients can't afford you, doesn't mean you can't make money. You gotta be more creative. I have another book I wrote called Compassionate Capitalism. It talks about the merchant priests. Talk about people that do good. Compassionate Capitalism. I am a compassionate person, that's one of my things. I work really hard at it. I'm not perfect, progress, but I'm also a real badass a capitalist. I like to make a ton of money. I'm good at it. I look at things and I just keep fighting it, going, nope, that's not gonna make money, nope, that's not gonna make money. And if it's not gonna make money, it's not gonna help me, and if I'm not helped, it's, I can't help anybody. If I had to work all day long to make money. My businesses I, were failing. I promise you there's not one person in here I would have five minutes for. What help is that? I won't be able to tell you and say, you know what, let's do a quick five minute overview so I can give you a little bit of insight and acceleration to how to create a direct path to revenue. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Can you see any reason why you won't want to take the time to speak with me? I'm gonna speak to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, if I had the time, I would speak to you too. <laughs> Although my kids and my wife would be jealous. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Kind of more random, but how do you figure out a way to take like, your business life and put it in your like, family life? Like, I'm raising two kids. Like, I feel like I'm reading books on how to be a great dad. And yeah. How do you like, take all this business knowledge and you know, like, share that with them and help them understand what you're doing? And yeah, there, there's an energy. People make excuses. I got four kids and they're good kids, and I'm a part of all their lives, and I have, my marriage is the best it's ever been. Because I learn how to communicate with all of them in the, in the mediums they do. I'll give you a quick example. You know, you have so much time. This weekend, my 14 year old's like, mom, can you drive me to so-and-so? My wife's energy, no, uh, and I'm like, no, I'll take you. I'll take you. So what I did, talking about, it's like the trash, 
I said, okay, I'll take you. And I looked at it as, wow, what a great opportunity. I'm going to ask questions and connect and share with my 14-year-old. And she didn't know it. And then what do I do? On the way home, I put my earbuds in and I started five-minute calls going, you know what? What's your name again? Elaine. John. Elaine. Elaine's right on my phone. I'm just going to check in with Elaine. And I got 15 minutes to drive home. And guess what? When I got home, I felt so much better. Then instead, my wife would have got into a 30-minute argument, everybody feeling bad. I don't know why we do that. When it comes to family, I look at the whites. I make strategy, discipline, and awareness. You know, th these guys who travel with me, they'll tell you. I, I give my wife a minimum of 30 minutes a day, whether I'm with her or not. I travel with my family. I, you know, one, one year I promised my son, because it was important, he was six years old, for me to be his coach. It was important, I could tell, it was important for him. I, that season cost me $40,000 because I would sometimes have to take a private plane because I was not going to miss a game or a practice. I turned down speeches. I, th there's one time I missed the game and I did it on purpose and I told him, I'm not coming to your game today. It was a Saturday. I'm not going to coach. You know, the other coach David's coaching. Let me tell you why. Because I'm going to speak to kids. There's a whole bunch of kids that I'm going to go help. And if it's okay with you, I want to ask your permission if I can go help those other kids instead of coaching you today. It's the only game I'm going to miss, but I need your permission. See the difference of how you, you can interact? Now, I spend more time with my kids than any other father that works a nine to five job and doesn't travel. I promise you. Because I know some of them like to use FaceTime. Some like to use Snapchat. We, for some reason, we're resisting how we connect, right? And, we be, and take, take your own evaluation of how you can get better at this. My, my mom was the favorite. You'll love this one. My mom, she lives for her 13 grandkids. Lives for them. I have three teenage daughters, which she lives for. And they love her. She called me with the Jewish guilt. The girls don't call me. They don't love me. I would do anything for them. They're too busy for me, right? Maybe some of you this might resonate with. And I said, do you call them? Yeah, they don't call me back. I was like, do you use Snapchat? No. I was like, oh, well, I can teach you Snapchat in six minutes. And if you Snapchat them, they will communicate with you, and they'll think you're the coolest grandma in the history of grandmas. And you can send them bunny pictures of you and all kinds of fun stuff. How do you know I can use it in six minutes? Well, because my six-year-old taught me in six minutes. And you're smarter than me. You have a PhD in education. I'm sure you can figure it out because I promise you there are morons using Snapchat. <laughs> I've seen it. My mom's relationship has completely changed from someone saying, my grandkids don't have enough time for me to she's the coolest grandma ever. And I've heard the other teenage girls go, you got a Snapchat from your grandma? They're taking the time while they're with their friends to talk to their grandma. And I promise you, when my mom called them, they would look at the phone and hit the F you button. <laughs> Not because they don't love their grandma, it was the wrong medium. So find the right connection, emotional connection to your wife and kids. And you, it's quality of time. I'm going to break something to every parent in here, by the way. Your kids do not want to be with you all the time. I promise. And the older they get, the less they want to be with you. But you want to be with them all the time, the same way my father's with me all the time. And the way that you do that is consistent every day, persistent without quit, enjoyment of the pursuit of the potential of your relationship with your kids, and give it a minimum amount of time every day. And it's okay if it's one minute. That puts them in the 10,000 new thoughts every day. You're in their 10,000 new thoughts every day, moving into their 40,000 and reinforcing those thoughts and moving into their unconscious competency. So if you're not there physically, either because of travel or death, you are always with them. Every day, just give it a minimum amount of time. Best question yet, thank you. And most important. Question, Devin. I know this seems calculating and a little bit manipulating, but I believe you're an aggregate of the five people that you spend the most time with. 
I tell people, you have friends? Take your five friends, average out how much money they make, and that's probably what you make. One of the biggest accelerators in my life is I sought out very wealthy people to have in my business circle. So I started realizing that if I had a good idea with my friends, they couldn't do anything. If I had a good business plan, they couldn't do anything. And I started realizing that really wealthy people have five friends that are really wealthy because they're average, right? And those five people... Bigger. Two most important things in your life, surround yourself with the right people and the right ideas for what you want. Surround yourself with the right people and the right ideas. It's what you eat, drink, sleep, listen, surround yourself with that you become. Because the 10,000 thoughts go into the 40,000 thoughts, go into your unconscious. It's who you become. One of the reasons that I wanted to represent the Football Hall of Fame was because there was something special about Hall of Famers. They weren't always the best athletes. They weren't, there was something special. And I wanted to surround myself with Hall of Fame energy. And I did, and it changed my life. And it keeps changing my life, I'm constantly. And what's happening now too, is other people are seeking me. Like really important people. You know, it's amazing. But it started by elevating my own expectations of who I want to be around. Even within my family. If there's someone negative within my family, I, 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 I don't disconnect completely, I just fall away. You know? I'm not gonna lie, I, I had to, when I lost everything, I had to fire friends. My wife saved my life, right? And I called them and I said, I apologize because I love you. I've known you since the fourth grade, but I don't like myself when I'm around you. I don't like what I do, so I'm sorry. I can't be around you anymore. It still breaks my heart, right? Because these are my childhood friends. But I'll tell you, if my wife didn't make me divorce them, I'd either be dead or I guarantee broke. And I'd be around, you know, I, I love Warren Moon. He asked me later on in my career, he goes, man, it's amazing. How many of your old friends are in rehab? And I said, you know, thank my wife, I'm not. Because I, I divorced them before it became a problem, before it got into my subconscious, those kind of behaviors, and worse, into my unconscious, where every day I had to fight for my life because I was addicted to something. Could have easily happened. I know how the, the physics work of it. That, as much as I'm here and I share love with people and I'm able to share and empower lives, all that would be gone if I didn't have the one person that I surrounded myself with, the most important person, that my wife and my mom. And they can battle it out for who, who's warm. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, wait, what, one here because you've asked two. Yes, dear. I ain't I cry. You can cry. I cry all the time. Um, but I came back to say thank you. Um, today I came with an expectation. Um, because I knew there's some things that's going on personally. Mm -hmm. But today I came with expectation to to like feel that energy today. Cause I just was like, if I could just get here to listen to your story today, you know, that would inspire me. <laughs> I just really want to say thank you, you know. That's why I came back, because it was just in me, just to come back to Lisa and say thank you. Yeah. You know, um, you might not have been where I'm at right now, but, you know, your story still inspired me regardless. And, um, you know, that's all I just wanted to come back and say, because it, um, it really touched me today. And, um, you know. Um, thank you. You know. No, thank you. <laughs> So that, that's the blessing. That's just the blessing. And, you know, I, I've had that happen a lot. I've had people come and say, I don't even know why I came. I was at Michigan and I spoke. You know, I, every time I get paid to speak, I, I do one like this for people. And that's, it's the blessing. But I went to Michigan and it was before we filmed everything. It was a beautiful day like this. I couldn't believe these kids. In the, in the fall, it may have been the last sunny day, right? We stayed in room, same size, and then they lined up, because I wasn't smart enough to keep it open like this. So what they would do, I'd have a book sign, they line up, and the last kid was just like that dear woman right there. 
and he's crying. And he said, you know, I just want to thank you. I wasn't going to come here. And I actually was thinking about killing myself. Now, awareness, we don't know why, right? He doesn't know why he came. He didn't know who I was. I, wa I wasn't on the internet back then. My book hadn't really sold any back then. I was, no, you know, I was Lee Steinberg's guy or Warren Moon's partner. That's about as famous as I was. But he said, I, something called me. Right? Something called me here before he was going to kill himself. Now, that's an incredible blessing. Your ideas, you know, your ideas can change someone's life. That's why the five minute mentoring, I know, because in my head, I know, be more interested than interesting. Just because you, somebody loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. You know, gratitude, be positive, say thank you for everything. Possibilities, the probabilities, the perspective, those are the things right there. Every single day, I think to myself, gosh, if there's just one person in the room of here, a full room, that hears it the same way I do, that it, that is worth flying overnight, taking the train at midnight, get, getting up, right? Not making money, but helping other people make money, allowing it to come through me so now that each one of you that have stayed 45 extra minutes over, right, can go and say to your kids or your friends, hey, take a deep breath. Be grateful. This is okay. Find your blessing. Find your blessing. There are no struggles. Let's infuse purpose and passion into that. Why don't you use that time to do this? Why don't you do whatever it is? Hopefully, you, you know, we'll send you the video. You can rewatch it. If there's lessons that you want, remind yourself. Because if you're going to take something away, know that nothing happens unless it's consistent every day, persistent without quit, and you're enjoying the pursuit of that potential. And the consistency, let me explain one quick thing. It changed my life. It's called the zero effect. And most people get it when they lose weight. I have it all the time. You know, they're dieting. And so what happens is they go day one, day two, they get one times two. The more you do it every day, it's exponential. Day three, one times two times three. Day four, one times two times three times four. Oops, day five, McDonald's. One times two times three times four times five times zero. But next day, right back on it. Day one, day two, day three, day four. Oops, chocolate cheese, cheesecake. Day one, day, right, zeroed out again. So at the end of the month, in actuality, they've been disciplined enough to diet 28 of the 31 days in a month. But they wonder why they got incremental or no results. Because they didn't do it every day. Because if you do it every day, consistently, it goes from your conscious to your subconscious to your unconscious, even gratitude. And what do you get? One times two, all the way up to 31. And boom, I lost 10 pounds this month. That's weird. I was on the same diet, I only, it didn't work for me. I lost one. Right, and who knows? That's the same thing with everything I see in business too. Right, well, you know, I see the, the person that's living on the couch, sacrificing every day, building, you know, I see it with football coaches. You know, I, I see the sacrifice. M Mike Martz was one of our clients. Mike Martz, he coached at Mesa Junior College. He, was he wanted to coach bigger, they told him no. San Diego State told him no. So he coached at Mesa Junior College and lived on a couch for $50 in Pacific Beach. But man, that was his every single day. He was going to be the best offensive coordinator. And I'm being the head coach of the Super Bowl team. The universe has so much more in store for us when we do that. Coach Peterson, you know, I did this on my podcast. It's one of my favorite stories. You know, I've worked in sports a long time around the biggest names. If Coach Peterson would have told me 10 years ago, hey, Dave, when he was coaching high school, Ten years from now, I'm going to beat Bill Belichick in the Super Bowl. I'm going to win the Super Bowl for the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm going to be the coach of the Eagles in ten years. Now, I'm a believer. I teach people to believe, right? And I told you I'm a hypocrite, too. I would have walked away. I know myself. And I, and I would have looked at Justin or one of the boys and say, right? I, hope, I, I pray for his happiness, <laughs> right? I, the, the universe had so much in store for him even more than he would have realized. Even more than he would have realized. If, but what Coach Peterson did was every day, 
consistently, without quit, persistently enjoyed the pursuit of his potential. Whatever the mile markers were, million, two, coaching in college, whatever it was, every day he just kept redefining what the mile markers were. You know, it was like, whoa, passed that one really fast. I did the same thing monetary. Whoa, how did, oh, I got, I got to reset now. Because when, re, when I didn't reset, I ended up being unhappy. When I sat there in bed in my beautiful house and all the cars and, the, and boats and everything, I sat there going, I don't know what, I, I don't know the what. And when you don't know the what, it's impossible to know the why. And if you don't know the why, you can't get to the how. And what does that lead to? Unhappiness, no inspiration. You, all you're stuck with is no possibilities. But the minute you get to the what, you get to the possibility. Then you get to the probability. Then you get to the reality. I got a call. Right now? All right, there's reality. I would stay here all day. DM me, uh, at David Meltzer. I answer everything myself. You can get my cell phone, my book. I'll mail you, pay for the shipping. I'm here to be of service. Thank you all. God bless. Hi, Jessica. I'm Dave. I just wanted to say, I know you're a businessman, and thank you for coming, but I receive you that you are a spiritual man. So I don't know if anyone's ever told you, but if they haven't, I just want to say that you are a Some stuff I'll shoot at 24, and then a lot of stuff I'll shoot at 30. Well, I wanted to ask you, what was the switch that made you feel like you needed to reach others on their channels? It was just that paradigm of value that just, wait a second, I'm doing this the wrong way. And I think I had a blessing that I got everything I wanted, so it was a lot easier for me than most people because I was able to say, wait a second, I got everything I wanted the wrong way, and there's a better way. And I think I, I'm that way. And yeah. speaking others' language, then I it was like this time when I started to question if I was not prioritizing myself in yeah. that way. But I think you kind of confirmed to me that I'm, I'm doing it the right way. Yeah, right. you are. Thank you. Please keep in touch. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Oh, thank you, dear. Especially, especially about how can you be of more service to others. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I started with Wood Club with my co workers. <laughs> and we're, uh, we started with Think Big Grow Rich. And nice. We're reading The Magic of Thinking Big. And that's one of the Oh, help you get connected. Goodness, I'll send it to your book club. Yes. Use my book. Awesome. I mean, we did sign up. Okay, good. I'll send it to you guys for your book club. Awesome. It'll, after you read Think and Grow Rich, it'll make even more sense. So yeah. that's good. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys. Famous Tate's test with Pats versus Geno's here in Philly. I get a 20 minute break before I have to go at it again. But I have to listen to a conference call, so it's starting right now for a new TV show. We know. All right, taste test. Ooh, the bread seems better. Bread looks better on that side. Better here. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, man. Gonna be sitting here, just a winner. Hands down. The winner here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>